Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. And this is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's continuous coverage of IBM IOD. The Cube is our live social media studio. We go out to all the events, we extract the signal from the noise, and we bring you the smartest people that we can find. <laughs> we, try to f we try to get in practitioners, people who work with practitioners, experts, domain experts, uh, bloggers, pundits, uh, and of course we try to bring our own analysts and, and journalists as well. Go to wikibon.org for the research. Go to siliconangle.com uh, uh, for all the news of the day. Check out siliconangle.tv. Check out Kristen Folletti's uh, news desk. We're uh, in the process of launching our 24-7 network. We got a lot going on. You got questions, hopefully we got answers. And if you're a, a big data practitioner or if you want to be a big data practitioner, this is going to be a great segment uh, to boost your big data IQ. Uh, this is Dave Vellante, I'm here with my co-host. I'm Jeff Kelly, also from wikibon.org. Uh, right, and we're here with Paul Zakopoulos, Director of Client Technical Professionals in the Information Management Group at yeah, IBM. Welcome awesome. to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so tell us a little bit, tell the audience a little bit about uh, kind of your role, and then let's just dig right in and, and talk about what you're seeing on the ground there in terms of big data practitioners. Yeah, you bet. I'll, I'll tell you, it's uh, 20 years at IBM. So, which I think is rare for a guy of my age, I you guess. You started 15? Uh, <laughs> I did, I felt that way. But, uh, so I spent 10 years in development, and then moved out to the field. Started in database technology, pretty deep in there, written a number of books, and then moved into the big data world uh, exclusively about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Really saw that uh, growing market momentum, and really chatter about big data, and, and probably a lack of understanding of what big data was. Mm -hmm. And so now I run our organization of technical professionals. There are about 800 of us uh, worldwide, uh, responsibility for those folks, and we help implement uh, our solutions and help uh, teach our customers about how to get uh, flatten the time to analytics of our solutions. So, you said you've written a number of books. Yeah. On which topics? Take us through the, some of them. I, I, I won't take you through the whole uh, biography, books, <laughs> bibliography, yeah. but uh, so DB2 What are some for, of your favorites? DB2 for dummies, uh, DB2 certification for dummies. I uh, wrote a book on governance, on SGML, on uh, the new book here at uh, the conference, can, yeah, Harness the Power of Big Data. And last year it was really understanding big data. It was the book I wrote. So there. what do you so make of Oracle's, uh, Larry Ellison saying that uh, Oracle is the first multi-tenant uh, database. Did that, uh, uh, do I you think, agree with that? Uh, I think if you look at <laughs> Oracle 12C, uh, so I used to lead the competitive team, so you know, so I know yeah. Oracle pretty well. I think anytime Larry says anything, there's a grain of salt to it. I think 12C, I'd say the C stands for catch up. Yeah. Uh, if I looked at the multi-tenancy <laughs> and I look at separation of concerns, separation of duties and those kinds of things, They've been in DB2 for a long, long time. There's a lot of catch up there. There are a couple of nice things in the pluggable architecture that I'm looking into, uh, but by and large, I don't think there's a lot there. It's more catch up. I'm biased, but that's what I'll tell you. Okay, so, that, so we just had to get that in. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so tell us what's going on with customers. What are they yeah. talking to you about? Where are we, where okay. are we at? Take us through that yeah. whole in, in the context of big data? Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah, so look, what can I tell you? Big data is the hot, hot word, right? So I was on uh, looking around LinkedIn the other day, like a 60% increase in big data term skill for a profile. So unfortunately what that means is it's becoming so ubiquitous that it's going to kind of dilute or fragment what the understanding is. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm finding customers doing is putting their arms around what big data is. And, and I have to tell you, the word big data, I hate it. It's like the worst term ever, but apparently the industry is, uh, <laughs> I've gotten around it because it implies that all data is big, right? And big data is so much more than volumes of data. We look at things like its veracity, uh, uh, it's trustworthiness, so to speak. It's uh, variety, uh, the speed at which it arrives at my organization. So that's the first thing I, I start with clients is let's level set on what big data is and I, and I take them through that. And then I have to tackle the client who's looking at big data as the science project because that is a road to failure. I'm going to tell you that right now, folks, right? Have to attach it to a business need. So we see this struggling on what is the business case for big data where we see this science project coming up. We want to change those kinds of things, obviously. Uh, but that's the struggle. Give me the business case, give me the payoff, and how's it going to be different than what I'm doing today? Those are the key things. So, I'm inferring from your comments that a lot of people say, okay, we got we to gotta do something with Hadoop, so let's go yeah. out and try it. And you're yeah. saying that's not the place to start. Yeah, well, you know, it could be the place to start. So the first thing I'll say uh, is, uh, the biggest myth is that big data is Hadoop, right? 
So Hadoop is part of the big data ecosystem, right? And so we're going to look at uh, different types of technologies that are purpose built or suited for different things. Hadoop is an at rest engine, the same way in a Teza or a Teradata or an Exadata would be an at rest engine. I think big data requires in motion as well. So you look at our InfoSphere streams, look at Twitter Storm, for example. So we have to have that discussion. But speaking on Hadoop, a lot of people are jumping on that. How do we get going on that? It has some good purpose built things that can solve some problems if that's your issue to start with. I want to analyze raw data. I have a number of data that has a very uh, short shelf life. So when I bring data into my warehouse, right, it's expensive no matter what the target is. I'll propose to you that we have the lowest cost per terabyte platform around for what you get out of it, but I still have to enrich the data, cleanse the data, document the data, right? Understand its lineage, that's expensive, right? So if I'm in a discovery phase, that's great to go into Hadoop and try to discover those kinds of things. So there's some use cases to get started there where I want to analyze data that has a very short shelf life, but I could have other big data problems. Uh, and I think I, I finished your question with the most common big data problem I see is clients to me, they, uh, they're guilty of not knowing what they could already know. They actually already have big data assets. They don't know they exist. So I want you to think of, uh, back on a, for the Windows people, because you're all macked up up here, right? Uh, you download Google Desktop, right? Why? Because I find files all the time I didn't know I had. And so you can imagine working in a large organization, even at IBM, I, you know, I can't find stuff to save my life. We have some of this information. So we've gone from finding a needle in a haystack to finding a needle in a stack of needles. And that's a big data effort. And that has nothing to do with Hadoop. And so, you know, the big data story depends on what your pain point is. So where would you say we are in the maturity model of big data adoption? Are, yeah. we, are, are we still in the sort of kicking the tires phase? Um, talk about you know, where we're at specifically. Yeah, so IBM just released a study. Uh, we did it in joint with Oxford University on big data. We talked to a number of leading companies and professionals around the world to figure out where they were. I think you're looking at around 50% are in the education and planning stage. We're in the very low double digits, maybe 16 to 22% are actually doing something with it. And some of the problem there is around the consumability. So you know, we're not all Facebooks and LinkedIns and Yahoo's. Mm -hmm. We don't have thousands of developers who are Java, you know, Java in their DNA and programming. We have a lot of uh, existing investment in SQL skills and those kinds of things. And they're struggling with how do I get here and how do I get the skill. So what we have to do is bring consumability to it. And that's what's stopping that adoption from the learning phase, right, to the execution phase. So I think uh, one of the things of the platform I like to talk about is how do we flatten the time to analytics curve? And you do that with various features in the platform. And so in the big data platform, that's what we do. For example, uh, we put a declarative language around text analytics. So listen, here's Hadoop. You go download it, you can get it from Cloudera, you can get it from us, non-forked version of Hadoop. And then I say go build some text extraction. You're going to do some social sentiment analysis. So where do you go from there, right? In our platform, how we're trying to address that is to say, we understand that uh, SQL democratized uh, uh, relational database. So now I could write this declarative language. I didn't have to know the underpinnings. There was an optimizer which said, go get it from this uh, a table that performed these algebraic expressions, gave it back to you. Then we gave it a tool set, whether it's Excel or whether it's a tool builder like Cognos, a SQL builder, now everyone can write SQL, for good or bad. For text extraction, now we've generated in our platform AQL, annotated query language, looks like SQL, has a built-in optimizer that understands that the CPU is critical in that kind of work, and has an integrated development environment, so consumability. Paul, are customers looking at their big data investments, at least their data investments, um, on a portfolio basis. In other words, you've got uh, the traditional data warehouse yep. space, the, the BI piece, which in many respects failed to live up to its promise of a 360 degree view and, a, and, and predictive analytics. And, and in a lot of ways, uh, you know, the Enron debacle sort of helped boost that business a lot you know, with the reporting and the compliance. Yep, and that yep, was yep. a real win in the sales. Um, but there's a lot of spending that went on there. And then you've got this sort of new stuff. Some, a lot of it's experimental, but Clearly people are adding some business value. Our people and our customers, and, and how are they you know, managing that portfolio between the new and the old? Yeah, uh, some are struggling, right? Uh, some, I mean, we're not asking clients, and no one should be asking clients to give up their SQL investment and their warehouse investment, because it's very purpose built for specific tasks, and it does those tasks very well. Uh, per your comment on the Enron debacle, right? We had to have this trusted reporting data source. If you look at some of the NoSQL databases, right, uh, we'll kind of lack in consistency, right? You know, we'll trade acid uh, properties of a database for the base, you know, properties of, of NoSQL. We'll worry about consistency later. 
So I'll answer your question with an analogy and then you'll see kind of in that area, we kind of go forward with both, right? Because don't you find it interesting that uh, for NoSQL, the biggest movements in NoSQL is bringing the SQL API to the NoSQL database world, right? Okay. It's hot right now, right. we're hearing Ab a lot about that absolutely, this week. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So here's the analogy I like to tell clients. Think of gold mining for it, okay, or gold mining. So I think back to the gold rush, you know, 100 whatever years ago, and you had this gold miner and he would pan for gold and he could spot a big chunk of gold, right? And that was visible to the naked eye. So that data had value to the naked eye. And while we didn't go and extract massive amounts of earth, it would spike a gold rush and an investment of towns around where gold was fined and we'd go and find that. If I look at gold mining today, we have this new capital equipment and it's capable of moving millions of tons of dirt, low value per byte data, and spotting near invisible strands of gold. So as it turns out, gold needs to be more than 30 parts per million ore to be visible to the naked eye. So most gold today that's mined is invisible. Well guess what? Hadoop is to find these near invisible strands of gold, extract that in a cost efficient way, and then build that into our processes, perhaps into the warehouse or to side by side processes. And I'll finish the analogy with this. I was watching a documentary on gold mining the other day. And uh, a company's under some heat because they're not reconstituting the land that they've uh, dug up and put into parklands. And they say, we're working on a chemical wash. In five years of time, we'll be able to find finer granularities of gold. And I thought, this is perfect. You think about Hadoop as a low cost platform to store a corpus of data of which I'd like to discover. I bet you just like in analytics, three years from today, as sure as you'll find more gold, you'll find more data, you'll find more insights, more signals in the noise. And so I think that's the analogy I'd use to answer that. I want to carry that and uh, that metaphor through a little further and get your take on this. So one of the things that people often say about the, the gold rush is the guys who made the real money in the gold rush with the guys who, you know, the railroads that got the people there, <laughs> the guys who applied the, the picks and the axes right, and, and all the infrastructure around yeah. that. But there's a premise in big data that says, and Peter Goldmarker from Conwin is the first I ever heard say this, he said that big data practitioners are actually going to create more value and extract more value than the big data suppliers. Um, do you buy that and are you actually seeing that in the customer base? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, I think the practitioner is where we execute. So I think what the practitioner needs is this consumable platform that allows them to execute. So I view it as a partnership. And I think during the ecosystem or the ebbs and flows of the partnership, there are times where the practitioner is going to carry us forward, right? Uh, so today to get started, it's you know, the data scientist is the hottest topic going. Uh, you, know, you look at the starting wages for some of these kids coming out of university and it's awesome, right? And it's around math and Java, right? Uh, and so they're getting stuff started, but then as we kind of democratized access to big data, then it will be the us as the provisioners that help you. Why? Because I'll take your uh, common class folks or the average type of, of, of worker, knowledge worker we have, and we'll boost their big data IQ. And then the data scientists will come up, and there'll be some new technology, and someone else is going to push that. So it's going to be a partnership, and that's how I see it going forward. So you talk a little bit in your book about end-to-end. -end. Yeah. Um, what does that mean, and, and yeah. you know, why is that important to a customer? Yeah, so you know, one of the books I wrote was around governance, and we talk about information lifecycle management. And uh, probably one thing I'm a little worried when I see, and obviously I'm not going to say the customers here on age, is, is people doing Hadoop, and I'm like, doesn't that data have to be protected in the database? So if I store it in an RDMS, you have to protect it, but for some reason you think because it's in HDFS, it no longer needs to be protected. So when I talk about information lifecycle management, I want to talk about how does the data arrive at my organization? First, am I taking the opportunity to apply analytics at the moment it arrives at the organization? Because the opportunity cost, and it's a term I use in the book, uh, return on data. Your return on data starts to dilute the moment it hits your enterprise. What you're going to get out of it, right? What I could do with that data. So as I look at lifecycle management, I'd like to plan that says the data's entered the organization. I apply some analytics, perhaps. As it makes its way to rest, I attach to it governance policies. Is it immutable? Can I store it? Should I get rid of it? Should I enrich it? And deciding not to care about it is a governance policy. I need to make a decision. And then as it sits there, you know, to me, is Hadoop not the new tape? So if it sits in my Natiza database and I want to apply that into an at rest engine low cost, maybe I need a policy to move it there. So cradle to grave, that's what we talk about in lifecycle management. So I want to ask a question about uh, something you just mentioned. So, uh, you know, Hadoop is the new tape. Uh, you know, certainly in the uh, Hadoop open source Hadoop community, and a lot of the players we're going to see tomorrow and uh, Thursday at, at Strata would, would take issue with that. And I think okay. uh, we're seeing players like Hadapt, for instance, build out kind of on their vision of a unified platform yeah. based on a Hadoop uh, foundation that yeah. includes both SQL and NoSQL type functionality. Um, and I guess the knock 
on the more traditional or, or the approach we're seeing now often is HDFS, uh, connect, a lot of connectors between databases. Okay. Um, is that a long-term strategy? Is that yeah. a long-term effective way to go about big data? And what about these practitioners, these new vendors like Hadapt and others yeah. who are who are have this this vision of a unified uh, platform really built on Hadoop at the foundation? Yeah. So uh, I mean, you guys ask good, tough, uh, insightful questions, right? So I like it. You ask the same question my customers ask me. If I look at Hadapt, I, I'm not sure how unified the engine is as opposed to it's unified on the API level or at the top. And underneath the covers, it's kind of separate, right? They have some Postgres in there. They have some some Hadoop in there. Here's the notion that I go after when I talk like that. At IBM, we believe in purpose-built, optimized engines, right? So, um, I won't take shots at our competitors. I don't think one size fits all when we mm -hmm. look at the kind of workloads that we have. So I think IBM does a terrific job at that. Where I think the economies of scale come from that you're referring to is what is the portability of the development and the power user skill? Because developers outnumber DBAs anywhere from six to 10 to a factor of one. So if I have a transportable API or programming method across the engines, then you've got pretty much the HADAP model. But for us, I mean, we're bringing enterprise class proven solutions. So if I look at the IBM Big Data platform, I'll give you a couple examples. If I sit in uh, Hadoop and Big Insights, and by the way, I could slub Cloudera as the Hadoop engine in there, I can use the IBM technology to extract text, extract, to build a text extraction dictionary. Once I've identified that text extraction, so this kind of harvested artifact, I can move that in motion at the drop of a dime. There's nothing left to do. I just move it over. Why? It's a transportable skill. It's a transportable artifact. If I build a map reduce job in Hadoop, but maybe I've got some structured data uh, that I want to keep into the warehouse, I can take most map reduce jobs and run it in database in the TISA, which supports in database map reduce processing. And so now you see, instead of making people run to the engine, I want people that are great at what they do, text extraction, map reduced programming, machine learning, and I want them to be able to walk across the portfolio and use the engine that's best suited for the task at hand. The final example, I think we've been doing this a long time, if I go and program to uh, DB2 uh, for Z, and I want to take that application and move it across the DB2 Linux News Windows family, the SQL API is 98% portable. And so we took that concept when we introduced our Oracle compatibility layer, so we natively, not emulated, we natively support PL SQL in DB2 because we saw a lot of clients choosing Oracle not because they thought it was a better choice, but because they had a skill set in PL SQL. Take your smartest people, attach them to the business problems, but let them go across the technology that helps implement it. I want to follow up on something that you said, and I wonder if customers are, are asking you this when you talk about purpose-built optimized engines. Yeah. So a, a lot of the industry discourse, uh, Paul, has been around hey, we've got these silos, an application with purpose-built infrastructure, and we have to break those silos down, and the cloud is all about a general purpose infrastructure yeah. on which you can run any application across the portfolio. And then you see what you guys are doing, certainly Oracle Exadata, yeah. you see in, you know, many others, yeah. you know, building these purpose-built appliances. Help me uh, rationalize the dissonance there, where yeah. we're talking the general purpose, sort of, you know, uh, a flexible infrastructure versus that you know, very focused yeah. block of infrastructure. So I, I think uh, there's not as much dissonance as maybe you, you, you're, you're suggesting, and I think that IBM has got that flexible in it. So if you look at our pure systems architecture, we start with, ironically, pure flex, right? Which is about that exact elastic compute model to apply whatever applications I want in there, uh, be it uh, ERP, be it uh, application server or database provisioning. As we go into maybe what I'll call tier one, like for example in transactions, I need a tier one database that has higher characteristics of availability, higher characteristics of scalability without changing the application. We have these other systems. So in that case, we have a pure data system for transactions. It's kind of, you can think about that as a on-premise cloud model, right? It has the characteristics, the elasticity of cloud, the provisioning of cloud, the monitoring of cloud. I can add in capacity, take capacity. I can take it in and out by hour if I want in seamlessly. So we have that concept. And so I think those cloud characteristics find their way into our usage patterns. I think the cloud's terrific. I'm all over the cloud, love the cloud. Do I think every enterprise is running to run their entire transaction system on the cloud? Absolutely not. There's security concerns in there. I think first step cloud without question is around development. And I think Hadoop is boosting the cloud because I'm able, I think I get about a 100 node Hadoop cluster for 34 bucks an hour. I can do a lot of work with that. But that option depends on the data I'm crunching. If that data needs to be protected, I can't just send it out there. I have some provisioning rules around that. 
And so I think we've got some of those cloud concepts in there and they'll come together as we move forward. So you can accommodate, what you said was with, with Pure, with expert integrated systems, you can accommodate uh, that use case that I was talking about, yep. the cloud applications across the portfolio and you can pick the horse for the course in the transactional model. Yep. Are, do you see in the client base roll your own as essentially a dead model? Yeah, you know, I hear a lot about that, and so, so I was just talking to a customer today that loves a certain storage vendor, right? <clears throat> and then they, but they love the appliance form factor. Here's the bottom line. If I look at percentage of IT budgets and spending, okay, and if I forecast that out in 2015, I'd say that you're looking at maybe only 20% is on new server storage spending, okay? I'd say about 25% is on uh, heating and cooling associated with storage of which has double digit compound on your growth rate, so we got to do something about that, and right? So we're investing in that. <laughs> What's the rest? People. People. Labor. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question <laughs> to the audience here, okay? And I'm going to go on record and say this isn't happening for me at IBM, <laughs> I can't speak for others. How many people have experienced double digit income raises year over year <laughs> for the last four or five years, right? I mean, they just haven't. And this is in a world of of brick outsourcing, Brazil, Russia, India, China. I can outsource cheaper labor than ever before, yet the cost of managing these systems as a personnel perspective, as a percentage IT budgets is going up. That answers the question. We got to get to the appliance, because the business can't afford to invest in us three uh, cats up here. Right? <laughs> so a so another way to say that is, you, if you're going to roll your own, you better have a damn good business case to do so. I'd say so, yeah. yeah. Or live on the West Coast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Fantastic. All right, Paul, great perspectives. Really appreciate yeah. the, the candid answers and the insights that you're bringing from your customers. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. All right, good. Yeah, well, keep you. it right there, folks. We'll be right back with our next guest live from IBM IOD. This is theCUBE.